guys we're going to go over a new page on the website you see up here we have all of our familiar pages some of them have been changed slightly the HVAC training literature used to be called other HVAC data now all it is here is we have all that information for training we have our zoning heat pump training the unit nomenclature capacitors I don't think there's a whole lot new in the last few days on this one I might have put some heat pump stuff on there. Where's that at? Might have passed it already. I think I added yeah, heat pump training. There's three or four documents there that'll help you learn all about heat pumps and how they work. What I'm going to do is we're going to go over to field service tips and formulas. This is going to be a new section of the website, and we're going to talk about that today. Use that as a reference material. We see here we're going to assemble some new reference material for the boys in the field and girls in the field because I know there's some girls out there too I saw her on Facebook the only page that's available right now is the superheat and subcooling tips and formulas I just started this category there'll be some more stuff on there so we're gonna click on it and we're gonna talk about what's on this page superheat and subcooling now we have target superheat we're gonna go over this formula I know a lot of guys don't do this in the field they have machines that do it for them. But we're going to go over what you need to do if you are in the field you don't have the I guess it's the SRH2 or the I manifold or the field piece set up and you need to get your target superheat. We have this is the formula right here three times the indoor air or return air wet bulb temperature so you do that first and then you subtract 80 which is going to be a constant that's not going to change no matter what then you subtract the outdoor dry bulb temperature. So make sure you got the indoor return wet bulb temperature and the outdoor dry bulb temperature. You divide that entire section by two. And that's going to give you your target superheat. Now the example I have here is the indoor wet bulb is 60. And I kept it a certain color so you'll be able to follow along a little bit better. And the outdoor dry bulb is 90. So if you look up here, we have our three times the indoor return air wet bulb temperature. So we have three times 60 minus the constant of 80 minus our outdoor dry bulb temperature of 90 and we're going to do all of that then we're going to divide it by 2 so we have our 3 times 60 is 180 minus 80 minus 90 and that's going to give us 10 and we're going to divide that whole thing by 2 and 5 is our target superheat now it's it's not too bad it's something that if you do it a few times you'll be able to remember and use it in the field I use this actually quite a bit you can use, I used to have the field piece wireless transmitter and plug it into the little relative humidity wet bulb head, leave it in the return grill, then go outside and read it off of my meter, which is the SC57. Now they have newer wireless stuff, but that's kind of their old school wireless stuff, but it still works. We have some simple stuff here. Let me move my head out of the way. Move over here on the subscribe button. We have our superheat just regular superheat you know a lot of guys be like this is elementary school stuff but if you're coming up or you never really thought about it or you never really checked them before and you want to start doing it so you have to know how to do it all superheat is is your suction line temperature minus your suction saturation temperature and that's your superheat now reading along here is a suction saturation temperature is a temperature of a refrigerant at the corresponding pressure if you look on your analog gauges you'll see with every refrigerant pressure you have corresponding temperatures for different refrigerants you know the R22 is in green you have your rose colored R410A then your 404 maybe or your 407C depending on what kind of gauge you have or your digital gauges will have it right there on the screen have the saturation temperatures right below your pressures for example you know R22 around 58 PSI it's 32 degrees so you need those when you take your suction line temperature, let's say let's say it was 58 psi. So you know your saturation is 32. Let's say the line temperature was 52. So you'll take your suction line temperature, which is 52 minus the suction saturation temperature, which is 32. And you have 20 degrees of superheat. And that's somewhat like our example down here. Let's say the suction line temperature is 70. You'll see in the like the rose colored letters there. Suction saturation temperature is 50. So 70 minus 50 is a 20 degree superheat. Not very difficult to do, but you know, guys coming up got to learn these things one bit at a time. 
subcooling, same thing, you know, very similar, except it's going to be liquid line saturation temperature. Keep in mind that it's the same scale that's on your gauges or given to you on digital gauges, minus your liquid line temperature, and that's your subcooling. It says liquid saturation temperature is a temperature of a refrigerant at the corresponding pressure. The example is our liquid line temperature is 85. Our liquid line saturation temperature is 94. So we need to know how much the liquid refrigerant is subcooled below saturation. Because that's all the saturation means is that you have your condenser outside, your compressor's pumping hot gas into the condenser, and as it cools, it reaches a point where it condenses. That's your saturation temperature. And then you want completely condensed liquid refrigerant making it to the evaporator. So you need a good you need a lot of subcooling because if you had one degree of subcooling, you know, there's a lot of erroneous measurements. So with one degree of subcooling, you might still have some gas in the line or gas flashing in the line on the way to the evaporator. So typically, and we'll read down here about how much typical subcooling there is, but you can see our 94 is our liquid line saturation temperature minus 85, which is the actual liquid line temperature. You have nine degrees of subcooling, which is a pretty typical number. Here's a few tips here, which we'll add on to as time goes by. Tips, typical superheat for TXVs range from five to 20 degrees. A lot of times you go charge a TXV, charge it by subcooling. And that's what's written on the condenser. You need a required subcooling. But TXV should produce under normal conditions. Now, normal conditions is you know, it's between 70 and 80 degrees inside, your design temperature outside. You should produce between 5 and 20 degrees of superheat, typically. If it goes above 20 degrees, you might have an issue. You know, we had that issue with Emerson. There are additives in the compressor clogging up TXVs, giving them really high superheats, low suction pressures, high subcooling because that refrigerant was being backed up on one side of the TXV, the condenser side. So you should really see between 5 and 20 under normal operating conditions. The number two tip is with every drop of 1 degree wet bulb return temperature, the target superheat drops 1.5 degrees. And if you think about it, remember you're, you're multiplying that wet bulb temperature by 3 at the beginning of the equation. So if, if you just think about it, 1 times 3 is 3, and you end up dividing the whole thing by 2, that's what gets you the 1.5 degrees. So if you're watching like a wireless field piece meter like I was talking about, and your wet bulb goes from 68 to 67 inside, you know that you're going to subtract 1.5 degrees off your target superheat without having to do the whole thing again as long as your outdoor temperature was constant. You can go ahead and just do that in your head. Number three says typical subcooling required ranges from 6 to 14 degrees Fahrenheit. And it says here, I use 10 if no data is available. It's a good rule of thumb. Typical subcooling, I've seen them a little bit higher than 14 before, but it's not very common. Some REAM units had a higher subcooling. Sometimes commercial units will give you a higher subcooling. And I haven't seen it much lower than 6. I, I want to say that I saw 4 degrees subcooling required one time, but I'm not sure about that. I know that most of them range right there around 10. Number 4, a long line, on long line sets, superheat may increase substantially between the evaporator and condenser. So you may have to end up going back to the evaporator and checking it because if you have a line set of say 100 foot long and you're measuring a superheat outside, let's say you have a TXV and you want to measure the superheat to confirm it's working, but your superheat's 25 and you're thinking that maybe there's something wrong with the TXV, more than likely if you go back to the evaporator, you'll find a lower superheat that might be just fine and well in line because that's where your bulb is at, it's sensing the temperature on the line. So confirm it on the long line set. Most of the time you don't need to do that on residential. I don't go confirming it on every single evaporator, but if you have a long one it's worth checking just to make sure that the issue you think you see is actually an issue. Number five, charging by superheat and subcooling should be done when the outdoor temperature is above 70. Now I've seen some scales that say you can charge pistons above 55 degrees, you can charge TXVs above 60 or 65 degrees, but I think a good rule of thumb is 70, especially if you're charging and you want it to be accurate when it's 90 and 95 degrees outside, I would, I would keep it above 70. It's my personal preference. The indoor temperature should be between 70 and 80. Good rule of thumb. Your TXVs are 
run at a no load status or overload status whenever you get too much heat and humidity inside of a structure or not enough heat and humidity they'll start to hunt they'll, they'll be wide open and once they wrench back you're gonna have issues with the amount of subcooling that you charged with if you charge when it's out of parameters well, that's, that's pretty much it on this page guys I, I thought this would be a good addition so if you guys are in the field you can you can come over to these pages and look at them you can you know get out your phones a lot of us use our phones look them up if you're you can't remember the formula you can come back here and check it out uh, as always we have the group chat on the side here if you see it just added some new data on PTAC saying Justin Hernandez is trolling the chat today the PTAC data is light let's see if I can yeah I think there's one Familia Sanchez was looking for a Friedrich PTAC so I I went and found one but I, I don't think it was the one he needed unfortunately I don't know if we're gonna be able to look at that either I guess not. Oh well. So guys, in summary, go to the website, use the new page. There's a little information about superheat and subcooling that you might be able to use. And I hope you guys have a great day. Stay tuned for more Pro Channel stuff. We're going to be kicking it up a notch. And you'll just have to wait and see what that means. I'll, I'll leave that for your imagination. Alright guys, take, take it easy. Have a safe day.